Hi, I'm Sam. And I'm Max. And this is Movies Actually, where we give you an honest review of the movies we've meddled with so mischievously over at Maybe Movies. And this time... We will be looking at the absolutely amazing Life Force. Awesome. Awesome movie. Yes. So this is the 1987, I believe. Mm -hmm. I think so. Yeah. Toby Hooper directed. Dolan Globus produced sci-fi horror extravaganza starring Steve Railsback, Peter Firth, uh, Frank Finley, uh, Patrick Stewart. Oh, of course. And introducing the one and only Matilda May. Oh, Matilda, Matilda May. Yes. <sighs> the 18-year-old. Matilda May. Was she really? Mm hmm. Oh, good lord. Right, well, there you go. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> Should we just start there and then we can do the rest later? Because that's obviously what we did. I mean, um, yes. Well, it has to be seen to be believed. It does. It does. And yeah, when we say it has to be seen, it has to be believed. We are indeed talking about the uh, wonderful. Uh, Blu-ray transfer from Arrow Video of the international cut, which for you folks over on the other side of the pond, you really should take a look at. It's got a few extra bits and pieces that add to the joy, but also layers. Yes. Layers. The there are extra layers to be had from this movie. Yeah, the, the, there are. The, the transfer is brilliant, and again, as you say, this copy you can get it does have both the US and the international cut. Of the film, the international cut is is definitely the, the better version. Oh, definitely superior. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. But yes, I um, I'm trying to think. It's one that I missed at the time. Eighty-seven, so I'd have been what thirteen. I, I I don't think I saw it till mid maybe late 90s I think oh really yeah completely oh no I mean obviously I missed the theatrical run I was far too young but I was what was I I was 13 four, going on 14 there and I think it came out when I was 14 going on 15 oh uh, okay yeah, yeah what did I um, and it was just one of the trailers one of the many many trailers that turned up on the videos we would rent every weekend and we were like oh that looks interesting because mm -hmm. uh, of course the original trailers had none of the sexy stuff of course not none of the sexy stuff at all so uh it was just like oh space vampires this is great this is sci-fi and horror and oh lovely yeah let's let's watch that i do believe my mother probably said don't look ethel a couple of times <laughs> as she was wont to do when i was a child <laughs> just to briefly explain that when my mother was slightly disturbed by anything we saw she would throw her hand in front of her eyes and yell don't look ethel uh, for some reason, this was a family joke for her that I've never quite understood. Uh, but yeah, this is one of those movies where I got a don't look Ethel, definitely. Oh, yeah, so now you can see why. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I fell in love with it the first time I saw it. It was this just what, what's not to love. It's full on in your face, as you say. There, But then again, as the story develops, there's just layers to it. And then it just throws everything at the, at the wall in, in the third act. And... I mean, even, <laughs> yeah. Even, I mean, even at the time, because I know I mentioned it when we did it on the show. I sort of talked about it very briefly. But um, even at the time when it was when they were reviewing it when it came out, they did say certainly the third act is a homage to Quatermass, in particular Quatermass in the Pit. Oh, right. Yes, the absolute chaos of yes. it all. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can see that. Yeah. If you're familiar at all with the Quatermass stories, you'll you'll see the the correlations. The I understand it was on purpose. I think they were trying to do it as a homage to that as well. These kind of well, I mean, it's one of those things I didn't notice until we actually watched it for the first time for the show mm -hmm. that it is based on a book called The Space, the Space Vampires. Yes, and with a title like that, you can be pretty sure it's a bit of pulp. The original, and I don't mean that in a bad way because I grew up loving pulp horror, absolutely adoring it. And I've read a reasonable amount of pulp science fiction, but not as much as I have horror. And obviously, they were playing around with some really crazy ideas, like they tend to do in pulp. All I know, all I know about with regards to the book is I know they changed where they find the ship in the book. Apparently, the the, the space mission is to the asteroid belt, and Toby Hooper changed it to Hades Comet. This was released the year before Hades Cobbett was supposed to return. Yeah, because it was, it was historically yes. relevant. Yeah. yeah, yeah, of course. And apparently it's another one, unfortunately, where the author, um, Colin Wilson, didn't didn't like the film. Oh, right. Yeah, apparently the only thing... When asked about it in an interview, all he said was, well, 
At least there's full frontal nudity. <laughs> <laughs> well, yes, <laughs> at least there is, you know. Yes, but I mean, I think she's the only on screen for like 16 minutes, 18 minutes or something, in total. Yes, but they're all nude. Yeah, they are. And again, I was looking at that, that, that sounded like, I mean, it's another one of those... <laughs> we can't not talk about it because it was such a big part of, obviously the, of the production or of the filming of the thing I mean uh, they went abroad to look for because Madonna is French they couldn't get any uh, English actresses they refused to, to strip down for it that's why they sort of looked for more international mm. um, models actresses for the thing of course yeah that makes uh, sense apparently in Germany there was almost a riot against it they kind of properly uh, like they did a casting call and all the women that turned up kind of almost boycotted turning up. And they found that afterwards it was one of the German actresses they'd invited for audition wanted the part so much, she riled up all of the others against it, hoping to get the part. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, okay, fair enough. But yeah, and then Matilda May said um, her first appearance in anything. Um, her parent was very comfortable on set. They never needed, never wanted to put on a robe between shoots and uh, takes and stuff. I was quite, very comfortable with the situation. Yes, which obviously oh, for right. everybody else was a bit like, uh... Yes. Yeah, and they had to do most of her shots on a closed set because the, the first bit that they shot with her was strangely populated by set builders and carpenters <laughs> and stuff. And so after that, it's like, yeah, closed set. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> let's, let's not. Let's not. <laughs> yes. Let's move on from that, please. Yeah, it's very much yeah. one of those ones that you couldn't get away, you wouldn't be able to make it today. At all. Well, it could it could be made in certain corners, but and I don't mean that in a nasty way, but like for television, maybe mm. HBO could do something yes, like that. Yeah, I suppose, yeah, and get away of, with it, but so as a film, not really yeah. these days. No. Yeah. So yeah, Game of Thrones, things like that. Yeah, I keep forgetting. Yeah. yeah. All right. So before we get uh, too carried away, how do we <laughs> how do we how do we put a synopsis out there? Think of it as uh, the, the easiest synopsis, rather than, without giving too much away, is think of uh, kind of like what we do with maybe movies. It's kind of like sm- smushing together two themes. It's a bit of Quatermass with a bit of Bram Stoker, essentially. I suppose it is. Yes, there are so yeah. many plot beats in this that you can go. That's from Dracula, you know, or other vampire literature. Yeah, you know, he's right. He is totally right, <laughs> as he often is. Oh, uh, not always. <laughs> no, but often. <laughs> okay, thank you. That's probably the best way to look at it. As I said, it's one of those ones, it does pick you up and carry you along. And even with, even with the quiet sort of lows in, in the film, you are still being carried forward right until the end. It does, yeah. It drags you along for the ride. Yes, and as you quite rightly said earlier as well, so I have to say it, massive kudos to the score by Henry Mancini, the great Henry Mancini. Oh, yes. Yeah, I mean, I obviously love a lot of Mancini's work, but this is so... Bombastic is the word. That is exactly (laughs) what I was trying to say or not say. I'm not quite sure. Yes, bombastic is the word. It's... uh, it picks you up and drags you along. Um, it does the heavy work for the film, really, in it a lot does, of ways. It does, yeah. And what's so nice about it is, as well, is, again, because there are these quite overt gothic elements and themes in the film, you could have done the simple route and gone with a bog-standard horror score. And this isn't anything but. Yeah, that that would have been that would have been a really bad idea, I yeah. think. Yeah. It would have been... Uh, no. uh, but again, it's another, so apart from obviously, as you can probably tell, we do both really like this film. It's another one that did suffer from uh, being a, a box office uh, failure. It was about $25 million to make the film, and I could only find US box office, and it took 11.6. Oh dear. Yeah. Oh dear. Right. So yeah. it's very much a proper, uh, the definition of a cult film, it's gained cult status later, you know, after its release. So much longer. Or some That's... time after its release is what I meant. I remember it being a lot more popular, but that is when it came to England. And it was made with a largely British crew, mm-hmm. uh, sorry, British cast, uh, you know, almost entirely British cast, largely British crew. And I wonder if it didn't actually, I mean, because there are films that did really badly in the US and then did wonderfully in the international market. It's true. Yeah. And I wonder how it actually did in the international market. I mean, I did try and have a good look in all of the places where I looked. I could only find 
the US box office, and it, it even it even had the same figure down for the US and the international box office. So it was almost like they didn't bother taking um, stock of the or what it was taking abroad. It's really odd. I uh, that is odd. Yes, that is strange. The plot. All right. So in the near future of the past, <laughs> <laughs> which is basically yeah. what it was. Yeah. Uh, in the near future of the past, the uh, British, uh, no, sorry, the uh, ESA, the European Space Agency ship Churchill approaches Halley's Comet on an investigatory mission and finds something hiding in the coma of the comet. What they find there and ultimately bring home to Earth brings disaster and shenanigans to the entire story. I don't know if that's too, too, no, that's fine. too that's Heidi, fine. did I? No, no, that's no, fine. That's right. fine. With I think that's enough. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. If you haven't seen it, yeah, it's worth watch. Oh, definitely, definitely. You, you, it's pure, you know. Although not for the kids. Sorry, no. not for oh, the no, kids. Oh, no, 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 not for the kids. As I said, I was just surprised it was a, it was a flop because it's wonderfully realised sci-fi horror realistically I mean before this like Alien is probably the nearest thing like proper sci-fi horror before this yeah that you can quintessentially call encapsulating both of those genres as you said mostly British made part of it again if you are especially if you are in the UK if you remember like the 70s and 80s if you are of that age there are elements of this that feels almost like a unit story from Doctor Who yeah kind of does yeah I didn't think of it that <laughs> way but it, no you're right yeah yeah so yeah, yeah that works it, all... he's right <laughs> Shot for the wings there five rounds rapid All of these wonderful elements, and there's, there's nothing, there's not a bad thing you can say about it. Well, yeah, I mean, especially watching this Blu ray transfer, the special effects don't have the usual blotting or marking around oh. the effects that mark them. It's a wonderful transfer, and it shows that, that it was absolutely top notch effects that they used to get the job done in the first place. It was done so seamlessly that the, the Blu ray transfer shows no flaws. Well, no, there's a tiny bit just at the very end with the beam going up to the sparkly lights are not quite right. Oh, uh, yeah. yeah. That's yeah. the only thing and in, in the entire film and it's that I can complain about. Yeah, in a two-hour film, that's, uh, that's brilliant. Yeah. Uh, as, after last time doing a little bit of the, um, the, the secret life of costume, of wardrobe, <laughs> I've got for this one a little bit of the secret life of props. All right. Uh, the desiccated dummies that they used uh -huh. apparently were reused in The Mummy. Oh! Yeah, in 99, in The Mummy. Oh, right! Oh, good God, that's... They must have hung around for a long time. Well, I mean, that's what? The 12, 13 years? Or 12 years? Exactly, that's yeah. that's quite a long time in Hollywood. Yeah, that's true. That's true. That's <laughs> quite a long time for props to sit around for, you know, not be used. Or, or fall apart, I yeah. suppose. But I, it just shows you, because during the 80s and the 90s, they really improved the technology they used to make the effects. I think they last a lot longer now than they, yeah. they ever did in the 40s, 50s and 60s. Mm -hmm. Right. I'd love to have one of those on the set. It'd be fucking brilliant. <laughs> oh, that would be so awesome. Well, no, it's it's good to know they got some use at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. You know, they didn't get discarded like so many props from Hollywood did. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, as we mentioned, uh, this does have Patrick Stewart in it, uh, which he would have done this, I think, just before he started Star Trek. Oh, right. Oh, no, of course, 87. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. Just before. Yeah. But since then, he said Toby Hooper is his favourite director. He's the one who he's enjoyed working with the most. Really? Yeah. That's interesting. See, this is one of the things. Over the years, Sir Patrick has become increasingly, you know, I am, I am Shakespearean, <laughs> I'm a proper actor, I've done Witty for Gordo. Yes. And I think I'd like to see her naked and so all her clothes fall off. All of these things, which, you know, are wonderful, don't get me wrong, mm. as an actor, you know, are wonderful. But I can't help but notice that his output in the 1980s included Dune, Star Trek... Life Force, Excalibur, uh, Excalibur lo uh, lots and lots of genre picks. Mm -hmm. Is he a little bit more <laughs> genre friendly than he likes to admit? Is this just one of those late stage of life kind of? Oh, I'm I, I'm I'm a bit better than that now. I wonder. Or... I, I do wonder if there's an element of self fulfilling prophecy there. Everybody always refers to him as the classically trained actor, Patrick Stewart. Yeah, so yeah, yes, you know, obviously as a jobbing actor, he'll take the jobs that come, but. Yeah, it's almost like he's he's believing too much of his own hype a little bit, yeah, I wonder. I just don't remember that many dramas, 
starring him in the no, 80s. No, no. As I said, the I... old genre picks that yeah. I remember. Get them back on again, but even before she can get her knickers on, I've seen everything. Yeah, I think my... The, well, I mean, I think the first thing I ever consciously saw him in was Star Trek. And it was only then, after that, that I sort of picked him out in other things. Oh, right. Yeah, he yes. Yeah, yeah, he wasn't uh, somebody who I'd... I remember... I, I remembered him from Excalibur. Mm. I remembered him from Excalibur. <laughs> because of his shiny head. <laughs> Oh, wait, that's not that. <laughs> I was I was only about eleven. It was it was a notable feature at the time. <laughs> um, he says as he's just been looking, staring straight at the top of my head. He <laughs> thought I didn't know it's my fucking shit. I was not going there at all. I was going nowhere near there. <laughs> um, but he was he was because he was a young looking man who didn't yes. have any hair. Yes, and looked, yeah. I, eleven-year-old me was like, "Why is that? That is so weird." But then the next time I noticed him was indeed in Star Trek, right? And yeah. of course, that quickly overtook everything else. Yes, yeah, absolutely, yeah. But still not good. Come! Come! <laughs> Back to the film, very briefly. It's definitely worth your uh, worth your time, uh, as, you, as you said. Not for the kiddies. But give it a look. It's fantastic. It's wonderful. It's everything a sci-fi horror film should be. Yeah, it's a bombastic romp. Mm -hmm. Yep. And again, what do you expect from the guy who directed Texas Chainsaw Massacre? So you obviously you've got the horror chops there. Do it from a screenplay by um, Dan O'Banion. Oh, of course. Banyan, yes. Ba Bannon. Dan O'Banion. Bannon. Sorry. From various things. Like he did the screenplay for Alien. Directed. Return of the Living Dead. Indeed. If you haven't seen that one, oh my god. <laughs> oh yes, I mean that's that's it's one of those uh, genre-defining zombie movies. It is that's yes. worth your time. Yes, we will we'll get there one day. One day. One we'll day. We'll find an excuse. Yes. But for this one, most definitely, all of the thumbs. All of the thumbs, definitely worth your time. Yes. Uh, just make sure the kids are tucked away before you turn it on. Yes. And for that reason alone, it gets a big toe as well. <laughs> well, the tip of my... Sh no. <laughs> what he said. Exactly. <laughs> and for the absolute, absolute last time, it's the last time I'm going to say it, Sam, would you please just put on the glasses? We'll see you next time. Here I go. Oh.